I don't know the NCAA recruiting calendar by heart, but I know that this clearly is a contact period because Carolina men's <laughs> golf coach Andrew DiBattetto is here in studio, yep. and the only possible explanation is he wants to talk to Jones. Yep. That's, yep. Central's got J.R. Smith, and yep. Coach DiBattetto's like, we need somebody to match up yep. with him. What about this Angel character? Yep. That is exactly what I thought we were doing here this morning. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I'm just going to get out of the way. Yep. You can make your pitch to Jones. Right. He nearly made a hole-in-one one yeah. time. <laughs> no, let me explain this story, and he's gonna be, you're going to be impressed. <laughs> All right, so I, I was I am. yeah. So I was. <laughs> he kind of gave a roll of the yeah. eyes. <laughs> so I was playing in the Carolina Kids Classic this past spring, a world-renowned yeah, tournament. That's right, essentially the Masters. <laughs> so first time I played, I played maybe once, like, and I like to play. I play frequently, <laughs> but because monthly, yeah, but because of COVID, I just hadn't been able to play very much. Because a lot of times when I play, it's in like charity events and stuff. So it, I'd played maybe once in the previous eighteen months. So to say it had been a bit of an ugly round, an understatement, right? If we're if this is about recruiting, that's not a good start. <laughs> <laughs> but hold on, but I grinded through <laughs> fighting through adversity. I like yes, it. But, okay. <laughs> so I step up to the 18th tee. It's on this tee box. Me, Colin Bates, former pitcher here at Carolina, Tyler Zeller, Antoine Jameson, Tyler Hansbro. Okay? I think he's trying to say he can handle pressure. That is exactly what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Par three, 175 yards, totally over water. (laughs) No, Adam, isn't this true? This is the way you tell it every time. Definitely into the wind with a tuck in. Yeah, that's right. Had to be. (laughs) And, dude, I'm not lying, coach. Two inches. Two inches from the cup. Do I dare ask what club you hit? Remember, it was into the wind. Yeah, that's right. Let me try. I'm trying to. I think I hit. It was 175. I think I had a six. I think I had a six <laughs> to like two inches. I was impressed with myself. Yeah. If you can't tell. It sounds like you might be recruitable. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrew DiBattetto is here. He actually does coach good golfers, not people like me. And uh, we're so excited to have you here, Coach. What's going on? How are you? All good. Um, wild, crazy, busy, uh, but uh, excited for what we got coming up uh, this weekend and next week, which is our last term in the fall, the Williams Cup, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, but been a good season so far and uh, hoping to close it out on a high night, high note. I don't even think of this as prime college golf time, but your programs had an incredible summer slash fall. What what's gone right? What's what's been going so well these last two or three months? Um, well, I think it's been the build up to this point. Um, and a lot of people have asked that question, kind of what's the difference in your program? And, and ultimately, you know, the university is the same. The campus is the same. Our facility is the same. It's really just the people and the culture. Um, it's the young people that we're bringing into our program. It's, uh, the Austin greasers of the world, which obviously you guys uh, have followed and spent time with, um, you know, Peter Fountain, even Ryan Gerard, who's now a fifth year senior, uh, just how much he has transformed on and off the golf course. Um, you know, Dougie Ergood. David Ford, all these kids, they just, um, they, it's really cool because they all have really unique and different personalities. Um, but the common denominator for so many of them is they have this relentless drive and pursuit to be the best that they can. Um, so they just, I mean, they just outwork everybody in my opinion. And obviously it's, you're not at other facilities to see exactly what everybody's doing, but there's no way. And I've said this a bunch of times, there's no way that people, can outwork our guys. Um, they can probably match what they're doing, but it's nearly impossible to to spend more time at your craft getting better than than what our guys are doing right now. We've asked student athletes who are both on the golf teams and the tennis teams a similar question, so I'd love to get your answer from the coaching perspective. How do you foster the team mentality in a sport that is so individual yeah that is a great question and it's it's interesting because i just was on the phone with one of our guys late last night talking about this um and especially for freshmen when they first come in it's really weird because it's this individual sport and it's all you've ever known and sure maybe you play high school golf um you know which is great but it's not anything really close to what we do in a team setting so you take this individual game where all you've done your entire life is focus on you. And all of a sudden you come together and you're supposed to compete as a team. Uh, and it just brings a lot of really interesting team dynamics into play. Um, you know, but 
basically it kind of goes back to the recruiting process again is we're trying to find kids uh that care and we're trying to find kids that have played team sports and they understand the concept of team um and we want them to focus on their games as individuals you know but we also want them to care about what we are doing as a group and if if you talk to our guys and you ask them questions right now i think you'll find and this is pretty rare in today's world which is unfortunate but our guys would rather bring home a national championship as a team to Chapel Hill than have individual success. And now they want to have individual success. You know, it doesn't mean they don't want to have individual success and especially at the next level, but they deeply, deeply care about what we do as a group, what we do as a team. And they really, really, really want to bring home a team national championship trophy to Chapel Hill. Are there characteristics that you've learned to look for that either oh, that will definitely fit in or Conversely, oh, that that's a red flag. We have learned that that will not work here in this environment. I think a big thing is just kind of finding out their background. Like, did they play team sports? How long did they play team sports? Like, you know, Dougie Ergut is a guy that he he played everything. I mean, baseball, basketball, I mean, all sorts of stuff, um, you know, and, and then you try to find out like, okay, not only did you play team sports, but what was your role on those teams? You know, and all of a sudden guys say like, oh, I was a captain at this, captain there. So now, okay, so not only are they part of a team, but clearly they understand leadership and they care about leadership. Um, you know, and other things that we do when we bring recruits to campus for visits is, sure, Clarky, Coach Clark and I, we spend time with them, but we let these young people spend time with our current young people because uh, I feel like that's when you really get a true sense of, you know, who someone is. Maybe, uh, you know, a prospect or recruit, they might be trained to say certain things around coaches or adults, but all of a sudden you get amongst your peers and the conversation changes a little bit. So if you have some selfish tendencies or, or you might not be a good fit, I feel like our guys are really good at understanding what we are all about and trying to identify like, okay, yes, this young man, this recruit that came into campus, he's going to be a great fit for us. Or, hey, coach, I don't know, there's a couple of red flags. Jones, are you writing all this down? Yeah, oh yeah, don't worry. I'm taking mental notes right now. I've got my checklist. It's firing it off. This is Remind me, were... when are we bringing you in for your official <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I'm ready remember. anytime. I'm ready anytime. <laughs> um, when you took this, it, Carolina golf has always been, it, it felt like it was always in this place where it was okay, but it had never been able to consistently get to that next level. When you took over, what did you think needed to happen to take those steps and, and how have you tried to do it? Um, it's what we just kind of talked about it. It's, it's about the people and it's about the culture. Um, and you know, when Bob and I sat down, whatever it was four and a half, five years ago, I had this crystal clear vision of Carolina getting to the top, but it, it was about exactly how we were going to get there, why we were going to do certain things, et cetera, et cetera. And really, I mean, we talk about it often in our program, but we talk about three things. We talk about relationships, building healthy, positive relationships. Um, our guys know that we care so much more about them as individuals, people, young men, way before any shot they hit, way before any score they post, et cetera. Um, you know, part two is the student athlete experience. Um, and really, I always say that goes right back to number one, the relationships. You can't just do cool things for young people, treat them like crap and think that it's all going to work out, right? So you have these genuine relationships that are built. And that doesn't mean that everything's always positive, right? If, if there's, you know, some accountability that needs to happen, um, we have those conversations. If things can get better, we have those conversations, but they also know they can come to us as a coaching staff and say, Hey coach, I think you could be doing this differently, or you could be doing this better. Um, so anyways, relationships to not the experience. And then the big thing is our culture. And this is where everything comes together and it ties in. Um, we are family oriented. Um, we care very much about the team. There's accountability, there's leadership. We are extremely competitive. Like we tell kids in the recruiting process, if you are not competitive, do not come here. If you want to be in a competitive environment and you think you will thrive in that environment, then be, then come check us out, come be a part of it. Um, I mean, but at the end of the day, we are a, now a blue collar program chip on the shoulder. We got something to prove. We're not going to stop until we get to the top. And when we get to the top, good luck knocking us off. Hmm. And that's the attitude that we have. And, um, you know, a big part of that is, um, being mentally tough. And uh, we have a, basically a quote, um, in our program, it's on a big board in my office. And it says when it's too tough for them, it's just right for us. Um, and that's on and off the golf course, because as you guys know, all of us in life, we, we, we get hit with adversity, right? And we try to teach these guys how to respond to that on and off the golf course. And that's why the success that we're having, the part that I love about it is how we've had success. And what I mean by that is 
you know, coming down the stretch late in rounds when the pressure builds, like that's when our guys have been amazing so far this year. And in the past, we've been in those situations and Clarkie and, my, Clarkie and I might have to run around the golf course saying like, you know, just reminders to guys, like keep your composure, stay confident, breathe. We don't need to say anything right now. Like the win at Duke, uh, the win at Olympia Fields, like we, we got hit with adversity on the back nine in the final round and neither one of us moved. We just stayed, whatever guy we were with, we stayed right there and you could see the composure. You could see guys strutting down the fairway. We talk about that a lot, like the body language, like strut down the fairway, stay composed, be confident, keep that self-belief high. And, um, and so far it's been a good year. Now we know why Austin Greaser walks the way that he does. Yeah, down that's right. the so he, he's always walked that way. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things that stood out to us in the recruiting process about him. Um, I mean, at the time we first saw him, he was basically ranked like outside the top 100. And like you saw this kid swag down the fairway and strut down the fairway. And then you saw him hit a golf shot and you're like, okay. And then you talked to him and you're like, okay. Um, you know, and at the time it was crazy. I think the only offer that he had was from Cincinnati. It was the fastest recruiting process that I've ever been a part of, but it was an absolute perfect fit and obviously it's working out well for everybody right now i'm gonna start walking i'm this has sparked me to start walking with a little strut no matter what i'm doing i think you don't need a little strut from what i've heard yeah. you need a big strut. just right around pod world headquarters here i'm just gonna strut around yeah. look like at that it. guy walking out to the broadcast location that is a guy who knows yeah. what he's doing yeah that he's is about it. to call a big time game <laughs> yes right now. exactly <laughs> i feel like we've talked about this a lot lately we talked about it with chris miltonberg just last week what are the different challenges in taking a program from kind of off the board to a ranked program, a good program, versus taking a good program to competing for national championships, conference championships? What are the, the different challenges that you have to face as you do both those things? Yeah, um, another great question. I think my view on it is I think it's kind of it's not that difficult to go from maybe like a top 30, top 40 team to a top 25 team and then to go from a top 25 to like a top 15 team it's still not insanely hard like it takes hard work and getting the right people and all that but like that jump isn't terrible um and it's a little bit easier i'm sorry it's a little bit more difficult than the move to the top 25 but i feel like where we are now like these are the hardest steps right because now you're amongst the elite and now you're trying to figure out how to compete with and beat the elite on a very regular basis. And our sport is already so different and so challenging not to poo poo on any other sport, but like, there's a reason why in golf, the best players in the world, they win like six, seven, eight, nine percent of the time, right? Like we just, we won a tournament to start the year, won our second tournament. And then we finished fourth against a really good field. And like, we had some people reach out and say like, what happened? What do you mean? What happens? Like we're 33, three and two on the year, like in the sport of golf, like that's what happened. That's amazing. Um, but I think really the way that we view this and it kind of goes to who we are and what we believe in is we believe in our little bubble and sticking to our process. Our challenges right now are, are internally, right? How do we make sure that as we build this thing and we have so many great players and we have depth, how do you continue to keep guys happy? How do you continue to keep guys confident? How do you continue to develop the guys, right? Because we have some guys, um, you know, guy, I hate to label them this way, but for the sake of this guy, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I mean, they're really good players, like really, really good players. But when we leave Chapel Hill for a tournament, we can only take five, right? So what are we doing to make sure that six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 are still developing, still high with confidence, et cetera, et cetera. And then also too, we go back to it's an individual sport. Right. So we're trying to make sure that our guys are being great teammates. Right. So it's really hard, really hard when we have qualifying and you get beat by a shot and you find out that that one shot is the difference between a teammate and four other guys get on a plane and go to Olympia Fields and you stay in Chapel Hill. Right. And I feel like so many other teams on campus, if you're not playing, you're still traveling. Right. So our guys have to deal with a lot of things, whether it's, um, you know, maybe friends, maybe girlfriends, maybe parents like they ask the question, well, why aren't you traveling? Right. That's hard on a young person. It's hard on anybody. Um, and that's where like this year we've talked to our team. I think the key for us this year, uh, we said it early in the year, is we need to make sure that we're always having fun. That's a big part of our program. Um, we need to focus on all the details. 
uh, and we need to be great teammates. And if we focus on the details and all of our guys are great teammates, that will allow us to have more fun. Uh, and I think, again, just the group that we have, the talent that we have, I think those things will help take care of everything. We've mentioned Austin Greaser a couple times. What did him doing what he did at the U.S. Amateur, what, how does that help you guys as a program? Um, I mean, obviously just more more attention, more exposure. Um, you know, obviously I think there's a lot of people, uh, you know, to either follow him, watch him or attend the masters. Mm -hmm. I think our athletic director, I think Bubba Cunningham, he might be a little excited. <laughs> He's mentioned in a couple different settings. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it'll be amazing for him, first of all, uh, and just the opportunities and the experiences that, that he's going to have. We were actually together in a car the other day and we were just talking about, um, you know, the opportunities that he has in college golf the rest of the way, but knowing that his first two professional golf tournaments are going to be the masters and the U S open. <laughs> like think about that. And like where our brains go to is like, obviously you hope that he plays great and he has success, but like the learning that's going to take place, like, and you're going to go to the masters, which is a totally different major championship than the U S open. Right. So he's going to leave those two places thinking like, all right, I am really good at a, B and C, but if I want to play at the next level and have success at the next level, maybe I need to work on, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so overall just thrilled, um, first and foremost for him, but then also obviously excited about, um, just some of the attention that, that our program will get. It feels like the chip on the shoulder has been important to the rise. Mm hmm as people start to say nicer things about the team and the program and the individuals and they get more things and get to do more cool stuff, how do you maintain the chip? Um, Clarky and I are pretty good at making sure that we can always find a chip. <laughs> um, and, and again, too, the other part is just the competition that you have internally. Uh, you know, you, you look at what, look, just look at the way this year has played out. Ryan Girard, fifth year senior wins Duke's tournament. Right. And like, again, all of our guys are very happy for Ryan Gerard, but they also got beat by Ryan Gerard. They don't want to get beat by anybody. Right. So then all of a sudden we literally got back from Duke's tournament, the van parked and so many of our guys grabbed their bags, walked to the other side of the building, put it down on the range and went to work because they were upset. And then Olympia Fields happens and Greaser wins and the way he won, everybody is ecstatic and thrilled for him. Right. But we're driving from the golf course to the airport. The guys that I have in my van are talking about like how their wedge game needs to get better and their putting needs to improve because right now they're getting beat. And it's like we just started win, win, individual win, individual win. And all our guys are talking about is how they can get better. Um, so, again, I think it goes back to the young people that we have in our program, um, just being intentional and purposeful in recruiting. Uh, and like I said, Clarky and I are pretty good at uh, finding ways to motivate guys and one quick example was, um, you know, Greaser got a lot of attention after the USAM, rightfully so. A lot of people called. There were opportunities. More people called. There were interviews and there were podcasts and there were all these things. Um, you know, and then we started talking to a couple other people um, and they had a little different perspective. And they basically said, like, yeah, he did, a, you know, some great things this summer and he was a semifinalist at the Western and USAM at the runner up. But or sorry. Yeah. Runner up at the USAM. But first of all, he didn't win the USAM. Second of all, we don't think he's the first, the best player on your team. We don't even think he's the second best player on your team, right? Because you had Peter Fountain, freshman, first team All American last year. You got David Ford, number one player in the country, coming in. Um, and I may have shared that with Greaser on the putting <laughs> green one day. And the message was basically like, you didn't get to this position, you didn't have this success because you cared about doing all these interviews. Like you got to this. Except position. for ours. Except for, Except for yours. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, that's the pinnacle. Right. Yes, yeah. That was the, he did mention that was the highlight of his summer. <laughs> um, you know, but the point was basically get back to work, put the chip back on your shoulder and, and do what you do. And his, his eyes changed, you know, and a couple of weeks later he's winning at Olympia fields, which um, is probably one of the hardest tournaments to win in all of college golf because it's a major championship golf course. And because it's the best teams in the country. I love UNC Finlay. I go there and play all the time. How's it need to be better for you guys? Um, ideally, if we could replicate major championship golf conditions every single day, that's what's going to help our guys, right? So a lot of times that's firm and fast. Um, it's a difficult layout. It's demanding shots. It's shots that make you uncomfortable, um, right? If you play a really hard golf course, 
uh, every single day. It's just going to, you're going to get extremely good feedback on what am I doing? Well, where can I get better? Uh, and our golf course, um, all things considered, I mean, for a public, you know, university golf course, I mean, it's really, really darn good. Um, you know, but, uh, we will be making some changes coming up here in the near future, uh, that we're all very excited about, especially because it involves so many people from the Carolina family. Is it going to make it harder for me to play? This is all I'm concerned. I mean, about. we can add some tee boxes to make it shorter. <laughs> yes. And, yeah, and please. Okay. You. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, all right. Yes. Also not a good question to ask in the recruiting process. <laughs> <laughs> I need the easiest course possible. <laughs> Just side note, you should join the Rams Club, ramsclub.com. Maybe you could help out and be part of that project. Um, just by nature of your sport and by nature of what you're trying to do with the program, what percent of your job is technical and what percent of your job is mental? Uh, <laughs> a lot of it is mental. Um, at this point, the way we do it in the recruiting process, like pretty much all of our guys, they already, by the time they get to us, they already have a swing coach. Um, and what we do is we try to encourage our guys to continue that relationship with their swing coach. But now this, you know, circle gets a little bit bigger. We just ask that we're involved in the circle, right? So that we can communicate with our guy, with the swing coach, et cetera, et cetera. Because at the end of the day, like we are now the ones that see the kid every day, all day. Like we see him on the range. We see, how, we see how that translates into qualifying. Then we see how that translates into tournaments, you know, under pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if a guy asks me and Clarky, like, hey, can you come take a look at this? Or I'm, you know, hitting, you know, a leaky kind of block to the right. Well, yes, absolutely. We'll go out and we'll help. Sometimes the help is what we see with our eyes and communicating that. Sometimes it's we take a video and send it to the swing coach, whatever. Uh, we're not really in the business of trying to rebuild a golf swing, but where we are really good at um is all the other stuff and a lot of that has to do with the mental um a lot of it is um you know course management and really just self-management how do our guys handle themselves on the golf course how do they handle themselves in qualifying when they win how do they handle themselves in qualifying when they get beat um etc cetera, etc cetera. so i mean a lot of it um what we do is kind of on the mental side the course management side uh, Clarky is really, really, really good at that stuff, especially kind of like the sports psychology thing. Um, but I feel like we're, we are big time on self-belief and confidence, not just on the golf course, but in life in general, that's a, a big time message that we try to hit home with our guys. How do you, how do you get the trust? I mean, they, they've got this swing coach who essentially got them to where they are. How do you get to the point where you, it, it's not awkward, I guess, because that's their guy. But now you're their guy, but you're kind of both their guy. Yeah. Are you talking about trust from like from the student athletes or yes. from the, I think. Well, it, and from the family. I think it goes back to um, what we talked about. Priority number one is the relationships, right? Our guys know that we, we care about them and we, we care about them as human beings uh, and young people. And we want them to be successful in all areas of life. So, you know, if they're coming to us, asking us for help, like they trust us, they respect us because that relationship is in place. Uh, so for us, I mean, honestly, it, it's, it comes across for us as a pretty, as an easy answer because those relationships are in place. All right. We mentioned the Williams cup earlier coming up this weekend. Tell us about it. How did this come about? Why was this the right thing to do? Uh, the tournament itself, it's something just trying to get to Eagle point is something we've been working on for probably three or four years. Uh, we want to try to have one of the best, most elite tournaments in all of college golf. Uh, and a lot of times in order to do that, you need to have an amazing golf course, which is exactly what Eagle Point is. Uh, it's a top 100 golf course. The PJ Tour went there a few years ago. All the guys on tour raved about it. Um, it is difficult. It is demanding, but it's also fair. Uh, so it's going to be a great test. All the players are going to learn about their games late in the semester, right? So then you go into the off season, kind of knowing what you need to work on. Um, and then we had to come up with the tournament name. Um, and we, you know, we threw out some things had some ideas. And then obviously, um, you know, with, with coach Williams and his announcement, um, just, it seemed like it was the right thing to do was ask him and Wanda if they wanted to be a part of this. And you guys know this, and I'm assuming the people listening by now, they know this, but, um, what the two of them mean to this university and this athletic department and what they do for this university and for this athletic department. I mean, it, it's, it's insane. Um, and I think people know now, but like financially they support every 
team on this campus every single year. I mean, and for us, it's special too, because uh, I think it's fair to say everybody knows this. He's <laughs> kind of a big golfer, um, right? And so we've been so fortunate and so blessed because he's around us quite a bit. Like he's around me and Clarky quite a bit, even during their season. His One of his kind of release points was he would, you know, he would sometimes make his laps around campus, but sometimes he would come visit us and, and hit balls for 30 minutes. Um, you know, so we just built up this amazing relationship and, um, it just seemed like the right thing to do to have a conversation with him to see if we could recognize him and Wanda in this way. Uh, and it's it, honestly, it's been very special and should be a great thing this weekend. You're right that he doesn't talk about it a ton, but I think people have slowly caught on to the idea that this is someone who's really been supporting all these teams, not just going to games and matches and things like that, but actually writing checks. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time you figured out, oh, this is not just someone who likes golf and is going to say, hey, Andrew, great job this weekend, but is actually going to help us tangibly do things? I mean, basically, it goes back. I just, I guess the first memory that I have, I have a lot of memories of coach, but, um, my first memory was when I was an assistant coach, he showed up at like six in the morning and this probably isn't going to directly answer your question, but I think it's some cool stories to, to, to give people insight onto exactly who Roy Williams is. Um, he's on the far right side of the range early in the morning, six, six 30. I'm the only one there. I like peek out the window, realize who's there. And I'm like, Oh wow, this is really cool. So I'm going to go out and say hello, but I'm assuming this guy gets, attention everywhere he goes he's probably here early in the morning because he wants you know just some time by himself and doesn't want to be bothered so i go out introduce myself quick two minute hello and i kind of started backpedaling to give him space and every time i backpedaled he would pull me in for a conversation and it's like wow like he's really nice he's very genuine so we had a great conversation and then um, it was a couple months later, he was out practicing. We happened to be leaving at the same time. He's getting in his car. I'm getting in mine. And he looks over and he goes, he goes, Hey, isn't it your anniversary coming up soon? And I'm like, what? <laughs> yes. What? And he's like, tell your wife, happy anniversary. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> like how? I didn't even know that he remembered my name, let alone like, like, and I'm trying to think, did I say something sometime about my, like, I didn't, I had no idea. Uh, and then the other cool memory that I have is, um, you know, was named head coach and uh, a lot of phone calls came in, but one of them was from Roy Williams. And he basically said, I need help with my golf swing. Like, <laughs> okay. So this is like three days into me being a head coach at the university of North Carolina. Um, we meet at like six, six thirty in the morning. And this is right after he had, I believe it was his left knee replaced. And he's like, yeah, I'm not hitting it great, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there watching him swing. And he's not moving, and nor should he be because he just had surgery. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking about and he's like, I just, you see this? Like, this is terrible. <laughs> and he's like, what do you see? And I'm thinking to myself, like, all right, how do I tell Coach Roy Williams <laughs> that he needs to rotate and move his body, but he just had left knee surgery? And I was like, I'm going to say something. His knee's going to buckle. <laughs> he's going to either kill me or Bubba Cunningham is going to come in and fire me right away. So... I don't even remember what I said, but he kept coming back. He wasn't injured, and I still have a job. So <laughs> it all it all turned out okay in the end. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, oh, go ahead, Adam. Well, so you mentioned his retirement announcement. Weren't you one of the very first ones to know about that before everyone else? I don't know. I don't know if it's fair for me to say that I was one of the first because I don't know who knew what. But um, I was fortunate to be on a very special trip. Uh, with him to Augusta and basically, you know, it was a two day trip. We landed at the airport. Um, I knew that I was going to be driving him back to his office. Uh, so I went to go get the car, uh, pull it up to the front, uh, so that we could put the bags in. And he was waiting there with Frank Edwards. Um, and he kind of like stopped and he just said like, guys, I need to tell you something. And I thought it was going to be something funny that happened at Augusta that like we didn't know about. Um, and all of a sudden he kind of put his head down. And then when he looked back up, he had tears in his eyes. He said, I'm going to retire tomorrow and kind of took us through the whole thing. And we just sat there myself and Frank kind of stunned. You don't really know what to say. Um, but he, he was so, you could tell he was so at peace with the decision. Um, you know, so now I'm thinking like, Oh, now I have him in the car for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> like, 
you know, say so we talked about a lot of things and um, we talked a lot about family and we talked about his career. And then I, it was funny because then I said, you know, coach, I know my opinion doesn't matter, but, and like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to say like, I hear what you're saying that you're not the right guy for the job anymore, but like, I don't believe it is essentially what I said. And after I talked for five minutes, he goes, you know what, Andrew, you're right. Your opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, so it's like, all right, good. Glad, glad we did this. I'm glad we had this talk. Good talk. Yeah. Coach. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Here's, here's, yep. There's your car. All right. <laughs> um, but it was very special. And, uh, again, just, uh, obviously an amazing basketball coach, but an absolutely amazing person. Other than Coach Williams, who's the coolest person you've played golf with in your life? Um, soon to be you, I think. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, uh, we know what the answer yeah. will be in a week or two. Yeah. He said coolest, not most intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't really know. That whole experience at Augusta, I would put that uh, at the top of the list. Uh, the other one that comes to mind is my great grandfather mm. um was just really fortunate growing up rochester new york that um my great grandfather uh my grandfather my uncle and then obviously my parents they were all members at the same court so uh whenever we were home for a weekend which wasn't very often um all of us would have an opportunity to to play golf together so that's something that that's that will always be special to me is it difficult to be the coach of something that everyone thinks they can do. Like if you're the soccer coach and nobody's like, Hey, let me come by and I'll work on my PKs. But if you're the golf coach, nobody has any problem. Like, Hey, let's go out and play around. I'm really good. Yeah. No, I think it's one of the, the fun parts about our sport. Um, is it, it just what it's what connects people. Uh, and there's obviously not too many sports that, you know, Bill Williamson, um, you know, played here in the early fifties, uh, big time supporter, like, the thing that still connects us is the game of golf. And when he comes to Chapel Hill, he wants a putting lesson and we can go out and we can play nine holes together. Uh, and I think that's just the, one of the really cool aspects of our sport. How, okay. Give me <laughs> just before you go, give me like two just general tips, not knowing anything about my game. What are two things that I need to do better to be better? That is a loaded question. <laughs> Uh, manage your expectations. Yeah. Okay. I'm uh, really good at that. <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, and I would say, um, I, I think a big thing that people, they don't understand how important it is. is just the basic fundamentals, like setup position and alignment. Um, you know, and a lot of guys, they're always like, well, how come I'm hooking the ball and they want it to be something with club face or path or th something like that. But a lot of times it's just because you're lined up right. And, you know, most of us, we have some sort of ounce of athletic ability <laughs> and our eyes and our brain and our body knows where the target is. Right. So essentially like our bodies and brain are trying to make the golf ball go at the target, even though we're not lined up there. Right. So if you're lined, if you're a right-handed player and you're lined up, right, like you're going to have to swing basically from the, the inside come underneath with a shut face to try to get it there. Um, but if you're lined up square, so mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing, manage expectations and the fundamentals set up alignment. Okay, now kind of the opposite question. I don't understand anything you just said. I don't play. All right, then don't start. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you to give me the sales pitch on why I should. And let me let me first tell you why I don't. Number one, because I, I am not good at not being really good at anything. So if I'm going to play. Yet like, he I, continues to do this podcast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I've got Jones here to carry me. Um, so I, I just feel like I'd be not very much fun to for anyone else to play with because i'd get so mad and number two the time so why mm -hmm. why why should i start well i think that goes back to a little bit of the managed expectations right because there are so many people uh that are now in the real world right and they can they play golf like once every two weeks and when i say play golf it's usually they get out of their car maybe they hit five balls and they go to the first tee like there's no practicing going on Right. So that's why it's comical when you, know, you get up and somebody snap hooks the first one into the road and they start screaming and swearing. It's like, why are you upset? <laughs> like you you haven't played or practiced like you, it makes no sense for you to be upset. You haven't had the ability to put the time in. Uh, but in terms of the pitch to play the game, it's what we talked about. It's just um, it's a game that connects people and you can play it for the rest of your life. Um, and if you think about all the, the relationships that are created on a golf course, all the business deals that take place on a golf course, um, like it ends up being a really powerful game, uh, because of the relationships that are forged on a golf course.